V-1 buzz bomb. The V-1 flying bomb was an early cruise missile developed by the German Third Reich Luftwaffe, its air force, created under a project codenamed Cherry Stone as part of a weapon series aptly titled Vengeance Weapons, or V-Weapons. These were intended for strategic terror bombings to instill fear in the hearts of civilians. The V-1s were launched towards the UK in spots where Allied forces grouped starting in 1942. During the height of the war, around a hundred of these terrifying planes were being deployed per day towards England. The V-1 was powered by an Argus pulse jet engine, the only mass-produced manned aircraft to use such a system that pulsed 50 times per second and generated an ominous noise, a terrifying buzzing that colloquially baptized the V-1 the buzz bomb or the doodle bug. It is said that this sound caused considerable psychological distress, as targets could hear the noise but not know where the bombs would land, especially when several V-1s were simultaneously present. Due to the short range of the engine type, most of the V-1 flying bombs headed to the UK needed to be launched from neighboring France or the coastal regions of the Netherlands. By the end of the war, over 10,000 V-1s had been launched towards Britain at speeds up to 400 miles per hour, 640 kilometers per hour, and at altitudes up to 3,000 feet, these attacks decreased as the Allies took back the launching ports from the Third Reich, ending attacks on the English in 1944. Among countermeasures was the use of Hawker Tempests to intercept the bombs. Rather than shooting the V-1s and risking a mid-air explosion, the planes would approach to within 6 inches 15 centimeters, to induce an aerodynamic flip. The difference in air pressure above the plane's wing would disrupt the airflow over the V-1 surface and send it crashing before it reached a populated area. The last V-1 launching port was reclaimed by the Allies in March of 1945 in the Low Countries. Operation Wandering Soul Operation Wandering Soul was a U.S. propaganda and psychological warfare campaign against the Viet Cong launched during the Vietnam War. The operation was inspired by Project Ghost Army, a tactic used in World War II by the Allied forces where they would play recordings of moving Sherman tanks so that the Wehrmacht would be fooled into believing that more tanks were present than there actually were. Operation Wandering Soul was developed by the 6th Psychological Operations Battalion, or 6th PSYOP, of the U.S. The Navy was charged with the actual execution. From speakers mounted on swift boats and helicopters, U.S. soldiers broadcast an unsettling soundtrack titled Ghost Tape No. 10, with supernatural sounds, funeral music, mournful wailing, and altered voices from the afterlife. The imagined ghosts implored the Viet Cong soldiers to surrender and go home, lest their souls meet a similar fate. South Vietnamese participants helped the U.S. record haunting messages such as, quote, Don't end up like me. Go home, friends, before it's too late. The recording sought to exploit the Vietnamese beliefs about death and spirituality by instilling fear that the souls of the lost soldiers were now aimlessly wandering the jungle. This targeted the belief that the dead must be buried in their homes, surrounded by friends and family, or bad fortune will follow, and that the deceased must be buried properly in their homeland, or their soul will wander aimlessly. While the United States might have successfully spooked some members of the Viet Cong, it's difficult to address the effects of the campaign, since those who responded to the recording usually met enemy fire. In some cases, the Vietnamese recognized the hoax for what it was and actually shot in the direction at helicopters and boats carrying the speakers. Jericho Trumpets Mounted on the U-87B dive bomber, Jericho Trumpets were the propaganda symbol of German air might. The U-87B dive bomber, also known as Stuka, was being produced at a rate of 60 a month, making a total of 336 planes by the time the Second World War broke out. The propeller-driven sirens on the U-87B had a diameter of 2.3 feet, 0.7 meters, and produced a piercing wail that was used to pummel enemy morale and enhance the intimidation of bombing runs despite creating 20 miles per hour, 25 kilometers per hour of drag. Alternatively, some bombs themselves had an attached whistle that would sound upon release, terrifying those below. 
Historians debate whether the idea of including these trumpets came from Luftwaffe Colonel General Udet or from Hitler himself. The U-87B played a crucial role in the successes of the Blitzkrieg warfare, whereby the Germans launched rapid attacks from a densely packed line of combined infantry and air support to create gaps in their enemy's lines of defense and complicate any defense with a constantly altered warfront. These trumpets became a symbol of terror for opponents of the Third Reich regime, intimidating as any war cry may be. Especially horrific was hearing these planes approach towns or cities packed with civilians. As the planes launched their strike, falling like lightning from the sky, this is what people heard. The death whistles were named after the conquest of Canaan during the biblical battle of Jericho, recorded in the book of Joshua, detailing how Israelites blew triumphant trumpets around Canaan after bringing the walls of the city down. The Third Reich used the clamor of the Jericho trumpets much like some kings of Judah had used the story of the original battle as propaganda. The downside of these horrific trumpets was that they slowed the planes down, making them less mighty in the face of modern Allied aircraft. After the Battle of Britain in 1940, around 20% of the total U-87Bs had been destroyed, and the fear inspired by its trumpets had been replaced with a better understanding of how to defeat the planes. Atomic Bomb Curiously, survivors from near the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bomb hypercenters did not note hearing the explosions. John Hersey's 1946 report for The New Yorker stated that there was a, quote, noiseless flash. Those further away, however, recalled being hit by a tremendous crack as the air expanded, followed by a groan from the earth that reverberated through their bones. A then third grader who saw the bomb explode, Kimura Yoshiro, said the following, quote, Everything turned yellow. It was like I'd looked right at the sun. Then there was a big sound a second or two later, and everything went dark. The sound, like a cannon going off, reaches those at a safe distance far later than the site of the explosion. This seemingly disjointed experience happens because light travels faster than sound, and anyone close enough to hear an explosion at the exact time it happens would theoretically be obliterated by the blast. High-quality recordings of nuclear explosions with sound are a rare find. This unedited audio from the Upshot Not Hole Annie test is one of the only few publicly available of such an event, recorded in 1953 at the Nevada test site. The 16-kiloton atmospheric burst was broadcast nationally on live TV. It's said that about an hour following the Hiroshima and Nagasaki explosions, the air was again cut by thunder that instead signaled a thick black rain. Hitler's voice. Finally, the fifth creepiest sound of war is one that disturbs and chills hearts for its scarcity. In 1942, Adolf Hitler's natural speaking voice was secretly recorded during a private conversation in a rail car. It's one of the only recordings in existence of the Führer using his normal, non-shouting voice. Hitler's visit with Finland's General Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim happened in secret. Hitler entered Finland with the excuse of congratulating Mannerheim for his birthday. Mannerheim received him at Amatra, not wanting to turn the visit into anything resembling an official state event. At the German's personal train, a sound engineer named Thor Dahmen was tasked with recording Hitler's official birthday message. Once that was done, he bravely continued to record for 11 minutes until the Führer's SS guards became aware that the microphone was still on. They suddenly threatened Dahmen and ordered the destruction of the tape. Instead, the tape was turned over to the Gustav Ikuna, the state's censorship office, and was made public a couple of years after 1957. At the meeting, Hitler launched into a rambling monologue where he expressed frank concerns about having underestimated the USSR's military mobilization and marveled at the country's crazy and immense armament of 35,000 tanks. He says of the USSR what many around the world had begun thinking of him, quote, We didn't know ourselves just how monstrous this powerful beast was. 
This is what his tranquil, chilling voice sounded like when it was away from the podiums and microphones. It was rumored that during the meeting, Mannerheim refused Hitler's request for Finland's help against the USSR after deducing Hitler's weak position by lighting a cigar and receiving no rebuke, in spite of the Fuhrer's widely known objection to smoking. (laughs) 